just what we said. Good evening, everyone. Welcome. My name is Janine Wendt, and I'm the Executive Director of HECMA. That stands for the Higher Education Consortium of Central Massachusetts. So what's a consortium? Uh, the Higher Education Consortium of Central Massachusetts is an organization that supports the mission of the colleges, and I try to help the presidents and the executive leaders of the college to advance their own campus mission through collaboration. And this event is actually one of those collaborative opportunities where your admissions and financial aid professionals are here to talk to you together. Um, even though uh, in some ways they might compete with one another, they're working together uh, to give you the best information that you can as you pursue your, um, your dream of continuing higher education. Uh, one of the opportunities that I would like to share for students that are enrolled in one of the HECMA member institutions that you see here is that students can cross-register, any undergraduate full-time day student can cross-register and take a course at any of the other member institutions, one course per term at no cost to them unless there is some sort of special fee for the course, like a lab fee for a science course or something like that. So um, that's one, one of the ways that HECMA engages with our students, but if you do decide to go to a HECMA member institution, you will probably learn a little bit more about what we do. I'm going to turn the mic over to... John Hamill from Anna Maria College. And I, this is probably the first time in my career where I've been on one of these panels and, and I've gotten to go first. <laughs> so first of all, welcome as you begin your search I would just add to Jadine's comments, while we do all compete for students and we do all want the right students on our campuses, the bigger goal really for us professionally is to help you make a good decision and that's really why we're here tonight. So I've said to students that I've visited with, I've worked with students for many years, I used to have hair when I first started doing this. Um, the bigger goal really is if we can help you make a decision by talking with one of our colleagues, if, we can, if you can't find something on my campus, we're happy to refer you to another campus. So I think there is a rich resource of admissions and financial aid people here. Um, we hope that over the course of the next six months a year, you'll take advantage of us. If, if you have younger siblings, children, we'll hopefully be back again next year. Um, Anna Maria College is a small liberal arts college located about 20 minutes from here. Health science programs, nursing programs, business programs, about 1,100 undergraduate students, 500 graduate students, number of specialized online programs. Um, we have a, a fairly robust adult population that works through our online programs. Um, B to B plus student, we're an SAT optional school and that's a transition into my topic which is optional testing. Um, as you go through this process, you're best and well served by organizing this in some way. For both of my sons, I'll put on the dad hat for a minute, um, we kept a simple spreadsheet, or they did. Um, just looking at and thinking about some of the different rules of the road, all of the re admissions requirements at these schools are gonna vary, sometimes significantly. So SAT test optional schools really provide students with the option of applying for admission without sending in standardized testing. The SAT, the ACT, or other schools, sometimes an international student may re be required to take an international uh, language test. The SAT, ACT right now for us and for a number of schools is, is an option. And the reason that is is that schools have found that a number of schools have found Bates College actually started in the early 1980s, a long-term study that looked at how well that test <coughs> is it does in predicting success for students that take it. And what they found, and I think a number of schools have found over time, is that single, singly the best predictor is the student's grades. Um, there are some biases in the test people feel, there are costs associated with the test. So in order to minimize some of the barriers and really to give preference to what is considered and still studied richly and, and pushed as the most critical factor in determining a student's admissibility, giving more weight to the grades, course selection, the kinds of things that students are doing day in and day out. That's simply the best predictor. So 
I, I can't, I'm not gonna dig deeply into lists of schools. I think you can Google SAT optional schools. You'll come up with a list of, a number of schools here are SAT optional. Number, you, you'll come up with a, a list pretty quickly. Um, some of the schools will have specific programs while they're SAT optional, they ask for standardized testing. I'm gonna pick on our nursing program. Our nursing program this year just began to require SAT, ACT tests, or what's called a TEAS test. We ask that for a variety of different reasons. It is a very good predictor. The testing is a very good predictor for the final test that a student will take to become an RN. So we're looking for that for a variety of reasons to help placement with students as they enter. Um, that's the only program at Anna Maria that requires any standardized testing. All of our other programs are SAT, ACT optional. The list varies from highly selective schools. Um, University of Chicago, I believe, just went S SAT uh, test optional this summer, or this past spring, um, to moderately selective schools, to uh, you know schools that are less selective. Um, you really just are best served by looking at, Googling quickly, SAT optional. I think the next question really is, well, if you're optional, when do I decide, or how do I decide to send them or not? Um, I guess the best advice I can give you is engage with the admission staff at those schools. Um, the decision will really vary by what the schools tell you. Um, in general, if your scores are at their average or better, it's probably not a bad thing to send them in. I can be held against you. If they're less, perhaps you don't want to send them in. But engage with the schools, talk with the admissions offices at those schools. Many schools are organized so that you can simply look on a website and find out who the admissions counselor is that will be reviewing your file. Talk with that person, that's the person that's gonna be working with you to help you navigate the process. Um, they'll provide you with information that will help you as you go forward. I'm gonna stop here, we have a big panel, um, so that the other panelists can speak, and then we'll open this up at the very end for questions as well. John is actually our eager beaver and the one that helped put all of this together, so uh, thanks to John. Uh, my name's uh, Michael DiPiazza, I'm the Director of Admission at Assumption College. And for now, I'm just gonna kinda introduce Assumption. Hopefully <coughs> all of you have, uh, have heard of us, uh, obviously located here in Worcester. We are a medium-sized Catholic college of about 2,000 students. Uh, we're founded in the traditional liberal arts um, programs, but also have a real solid combination of uh, providing career focus or career preparation uh, and professional programs. Most popular majors are business, education, uh, psychology, uh, the natural sciences, sciences, um, but we offer over uh, 35 different um, majors, 47 different minors. Um, from a student life perspective, we're Division Two, NE10. Our football team is currently ranked 20th in the country. Went to the quarterfinals last year. Our neighbors here stole our coach uh, last year, but we're excited about our new coach coming in uh, starting next next week. Um, but we have 35, or I'm sorry, over 80 different clubs and organizations on campus, so a real great opportunity from a student life perspective. We have a campus in the heart of Rome, 15 minute walk or so uh, from the Vatican. It's a top 10 nationally ranked study abroad program. Uh, in addition to that, we're sending students to over 50 countries worldwide. So um, we really combine a little bit of everything, and as I tell families when they come to campus or before they come to campus, when you see Worcester, you're gonna be pleasantly surprised. Uh, I moved here two years ago from New York, and I remember my wife, when I told her about the job, her response was, what are we gonna do in Worcester? And I was like, well, let's just go check it out, and we've been pleasantly surprised with everything um, that we've enjoyed here in Worcester. Thanks, my name's Kevin Kelly, and I'm the interim vice president for enrollment management at Becker College. Becker is, um, uh, camp, uh, sorry, Becker College has two campuses. We have one in uh, Worcester, uh, mostly centered around uh, design and technology and nursing. Uh, another campus in Leicester, uh, it's a typical small college town kind of feel to it. Uh, where the animal sciences and uh, veterinary sciences. I should also mention we have a new school of humanities and social sciences and those students, um, that school is centered on, on the Worcester campus. We're about 1,700 undergraduate uh, students, so relatively small. I, I think distinguished by the, the kind of care and attention that small colleges can pay to uh, uh, incoming students. Um, 
You wanted us to address our topics now, or just I think the we'll intro? Just run through introductions real Fine. quick, and Sorry. then yeah. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. My name is Terry Malone. I'm the director of admissions at Clark University. <clears throat> Clark is a small liberal arts research university, also right here in Worcester. We have about 2,300 undergraduate students, uh, really drawing from a global population to bring uh, students to campus. Uh, right now, we have 46 different states, plus DC, Puerto Rico, and Guam represented within the US, uh, and about 65 different countries represented within our student population. Uh, so diverse in terms of where they're coming from, citizenship, ethnicity, race, socioeconomic backgrounds, et cetera. Uh, we're a small liberal arts research university, which means we're really trying to combine the traditional hallmarks of a liberal arts education and making sure our students are very well-rounded in terms of the classes they're taking and the skills that they're building, but using our research identity and, and the city of Worcester to make sure that our students have lots of opportunity to apply what they're learning in practical settings and to develop skills um, with outside of our walls instead of just on campus. Uh, we have 30 different majors. Most popular ones are psychology, biology, political science, English, business management, and international development and social change. Uh, there's uh, 17 varsity sports. We're division three for our athletics. We have over 150 student clubs and organizations, uh, send students also to about 50 different countries for study abroad programs. So really looking to uh, um, immerse our students in lots of different experiences during their time at Clark. Uh, in addition to our undergraduate programs, we also do have graduate programs at the master and PhD level. Uh, and our undergraduate students have access to do an accelerated master's degree uh, in one of 14 different master's degrees. And if they have a qualifying GPA during their undergraduate year, that master's degree is for free. So about a third of our students stay at Clark and get their master's degree after they finish their bachelor's degree with us. Thanks, Terry. Um, hi, my name is Diane Sabosky, and I am here today with Holy Cross, College of the Holy Cross, right across town. Um, we are a small liberal arts institution. We have about 3,000 students on campus, so typically 750 to 850 per incoming class. Um, we are a liberal arts institution, meaning that all students can explore whatever they would like to study. Students may have an idea of what they want to major in, um, but at Holy Cross, we do not admit by major. We enroll all students to the college, and then they can choose whatever they want. So if students are interested in multiple areas, they can take classes and all of those and choose by the end of their sophomore year. Um, we have quite a bit of switching going on and people taking different courses and kind of figuring out what they'd like to do. That goes for our pre-professional programs as well. So students want to enter our pre-medical program, our business program, our education program, law, any of those business, um, they're able to do so, kind of move around until they figure out exactly what it is they would like to study. Um, we are a residential campus. Over 90% of our students live on campus campus, which is a change. If you grew up in the Worcester area, we used to have a lot of Holy Cross students living off campus. We no longer have that. Most of them are on. Um, we do have Division I athletics. We're beginning our, our Chesney era uh, in football, stealing, stealing the coach from Assumption. Um, but we have 27 varsity programs. They all compete at the Division I level, which means that with a small school and that many teams, a quarter of our student body are varsity athletes, D1 athletes. Um, if you've ever climbed Mount St. James and the Holy Cross campus, they're the ones who walk faster than I do going up the hill, right? So um, in order to, to keep in shape, they go up and down that hill. Um, we are a Catholic Jesuit institution. There are a few Catholic colleges in the city of Worcester and in the surrounding areas, but we're the only Jesuit institution in the Worcester area. Um, so that's, you know, the Jesuits were founded as a, a teaching order. It's very integral to what we do on campus. Not all of our students are Catholic. You do not need to be Catholic to come Holy Cross. You don't need to attend Mass. That's no longer a requirement. Was in the in the 30s and 40s, no longer. Um, but, but we do have a lot of offerings for our students who want to get involved, um, including our retreat programs. We opened a um, you know, 55 acre property in West Boylston a year and a half ago for our retreat and spiritual ed programs as well. But again, completely voluntary. There's lots of sports, music, other athletic, uh, you know, extracurricular programs on campus as well. I guess. Okay. Do you want the stand? Yeah, it's, yeah. <laughs> a show. 
Hi everyone, my name is Allison Lombardi. I'm with MCPHS um, in Boston, um, just because I felt like the population um, could use a freshman admissions counselor. Our Worcester campus has all graduate students, but we're very thankful that they invited an admissions counselor from Boston here today. Um, a few things about MCPHS Boston is all students coming out of high school go to our Boston campus. No one can start on our Worcester campus. Additionally, we have a campus in Manchester, New Hampshire that some of you may know as well. Um, so all students start in Boston right out of high school and then they transition over into their respective campus based off their major, which is pretty exciting for our students. Um, some of our students will stay two years in Boston. Some of them will stay six years or seven years depending on their program. Um, we're a little non-traditional um, compared to my colleagues here tonight because um, there's only a few programs that are four-year bachelor's degree programs at MCP. Most of our programs are master's or doctoral level programs um, starting right out of high school going into their freshman year um, at college, which is really exciting. Some direct entry programs that we are excited to talk about um, is our PharmD program. We're the second oldest in the country for pharmacy. Um, we also have a six-year master's PA program, a DPT program, um, five-year occupational therapy program. Um, some really exciting things that if you're thinking about healthcare is a really great option for our students. We are um, a liberal arts school, um, but we are very STEM focused. Um, so you have to love science. Um, and that's something that I definitely talk about um, in comparison to some other schools tonight is you can't major in English. You only take two English courses. Um, another thing our students really love is that there are no sports. Um, and I know that's a hard thing to talk about, um, but we don't have any varsity athletics. Um, just due to our lab and clinical experiences, you really can't do a varsity schedule and be in the Boston Longwood medical area doesn't really work out. Um, I always talk about how I recruited a student that was recruited to be a quarterback and he decided to be a pharmacist. Um, so there are options out there, believe it or not. Um, but there's some great things in Boston. We're located right on Longwood Avenue. If some of you are not familiar with the area, um, we're right on the same street as Boston Children's, Brigham and Women's, Beth Israel, Dana Farber. We build in all of our lab and clinical experiences into our programs, which is great. Students, you'll never be searching for a clinical. You'll never need 20 more hours to complete your degree. We build them all into the program, um, but you do need to progress with a certain GPA each year. Um, so that is one thing that we always talk about our students. Um, over 80% of our students um, retain from the first to the second year, which is great. Um, we have over 106 programs all in the health sciences. So it's not like we have five degree programs in healthcare. We're not just a pharmacy school anymore. Um, some of our most popular programs now that are growing are definitely still our PharmD programs. It's definitely our most competitive program, but right behind it is our MPA program, um, really getting up there as well. We have a 4% acceptance rate into our master's program. So if you're thinking about being a PA, it's sometimes really great to start right out of high school and continue your years up to the master's level. That's what we have found. Um, and physical therapy and nursing are definitely some really great ones that our students are very excited about as well. So great to be here. Thank you. Oh, do you want this one? Hi, good evening. My name is Buffy Whitaker. I work over in the admissions office over at Quinn Sigmund Community College. And uh, Quinn Sigmund Community College is a two-year community uh, commuter college. We don't have any residential living. It is a commuter college. Um, we have over 13,000 students. We have a lot of students. The majority of our students are non-traditional students, which means that they are working professionals. Because we do offer our Center for Workforce Development and Continuing Education programs. And we offer over 100 degree and certificate programs. Um, we have seven areas of study. We have um, one of our um, areas of study has uh, their own building downtown here in Worcester, over on Federal Street in Worcester. It's our health programs. Our health programs are housed there, and they are high demand programs. We have um, nursing, occupational therapy. We have so many different programs. We have seven areas of study, and under all those areas of study, we have business, education, liberal arts. Uh, engineering, computer science, um, health sciences, and there are different areas of study that fall under each one of those categories. We do have, um, we offer a lot of um, student service activities on campus. We have athletics. We don't have a huge athletic program, but we do offer some athletics on campus. Um, and we do have uh, five different locations. Again, one of them I mentioned was downtown in Worcester, and um, that is our largest um, location off our main campus. And um, we offer full-time, part-time, evening courses, courses online. There are some programs that you can take um, 
90% of the courses are online, which is really great for a lot of working individuals. Again, we have a lot of non-traditional students. Um, and yeah, that's about it. Thank you so much for your time. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Andy Palumbo. I'm the Dean of Admissions and Financial Aid for Worcester Polytechnic Institute. Uh, first of all, I just want to say thanks to Hecma, to John for kicking this off, and to Worcester State uh, for hosting us here tonight. Thank you all for coming. Um, and I just want to say, first of all, this is incredible. I mean, like the selection of schools that you guys have at your disposal in your backyard is, is unreal. Um, I'm from this area originally. I've worked in New York. I've worked in New Hampshire. I, part of the, a big part of the reason I came back here was because of the schools at this table. Uh, to raise a family, to have these type of options in your backyard is, is incredible. Certainly there are great options elsewhere as well, but I mean, we've got the Paw Sox coming, right? <laughs> that's, a, that's enough of a reason to stay. So anyway, Woo, woo socks. Oh. <laughs> Go brave hearts too. <laughs> Cover all the bases. Okay, I'm gonna straight toward WPI. Um, so anyway, uh, WPI. A lot of you probably know we have engineers, um, but only 60% of our students are engineers. Um, we're actually a STEM institution, um, and we are a pretty unique school. Uh, back in 1970, uh, WPI uh, started something called the WPI Plan. Or the plan. Uh, and essentially, uh, it speaks to the academic ethos of the institution. Um, WPI is a very collaborative, um, experiential education. Uh, we do a lot of project work in teams. Um, and so our admission standards tend to look for students who uh, are focused on collaboration versus competition or individual pursuits. Um, you know, we look for people who are willing to engage in groups and, and, and thrive in that atmosphere. Um, so some unique aspects of our curriculum, uh, we have four seven week terms. Uh, students take three courses at a time. Uh, we also have a um, uh, sort of project-based curriculum where students are required to do uh, two major projects, uh, one called the uh, Interactive Qualifying Project, uh, which is interdisciplinary in nature, not tied to a student's major. They're put in a group with students of other majors. Uh, about 60% of our students will do this abroad, so they'll be doing project work uh, built into the curriculum at one of almost 50 uh, global project sites uh, the WPI hosts. Um, and then we also have a major qualifying project, which is typically group work within the major, uh, whether it's a unique uh, type of research project, whether it's uh, you know biomedical uh, engineering, for instance, could be uh, you know building uh, some type of new uh, prosthesis. Um, there's a lot of cool things happening uh, at WPI, um, so many that I don't want to start going down a rabbit hole and, and giving examples. But uh, we have about 4,400 uh, undergraduate students. Um, those students tend to be uh, pretty focused on, on STEM, although we have students who are in business programs that have sort of a STEM bent. Uh, we also have uh, interactive uh, media and game design. So we, we do stray across um, some other majors, but for the most part, about 90% of our students are in some type of uh, a STEM major. Uh, we have uh, about 200 student clubs and organizations. Uh, we have D3 athletics, uh, and uh, I'll, I'll leave it at that for now. Good evening, everyone. My name is Joe DiCarlo. I'm the Director of Admissions here at Worcester State University and just want to welcome you all to our campus tonight. We're thrilled to be able to host this event uh, and have you here. Um, I'm going to do a quick overview of Worcester State, but really want to make sure that we get into the meat and potatoes of tonight's presentation, which is going to hopefully be helpful information uh, for you to covering the admissions and financial aid process. Um, I am joined tonight as well by my colleague, Jen English, from the Financial Aid Office. So she's here to answer your questions about financial aid and also provide you with a little general overview of financial aid. But before we get into uh, the topics of t this evening's uh, uh, presentation, I want to give you a little overview of Worcester State. Uh, we are a public uh, four-year uh, medium-sized liberal arts and sciences university. Um, we have two different schools, a school of health, uh, education, and natural sciences, and a school of social science and humanities. So about 60 different majors uh, and minors. Uh, some of our more popular programs are biology, business administration, <laughs> criminal justice, psychology. Education is really in our roots. We were founded as a teacher's college. Um, so many, about 50% of the of the Worcester Public School teachers are Worcester State graduates, either through our undergraduate program or through our graduate school program. Uh, we're incredibly proud of the university that we have. If this is your first time visiting campus or maybe you haven't been here in a while, we have gone through a tremendous uh, transformation really in the last 10 years. We've invested over $200 million in the physical expansion of our campus with new residence halls, a new wellness center, uh, renovations to our academic uh, space. Uh, so we really offer our students now state-of-the-art facilities. And we've really 
transformed from what was pretty much known as a commuter campus into more of a residential campus. Uh, we house now uh, close to six, 1,600 students and offer campus programming, academic programming to really support students um, and give them a well-rounded uh, and really deep educational experience. Uh, so we're excited to see how our university has grown um, more recently, really, in the, in the last 10 years. But we really do have a really rich, uh, rich deep history uh, here in the city of Worcester. Um, enrollment is strong. Uh, we're excited for our future. Um, we're excited about our academic programming and what we're able to offer students. Um, our students are actively engaged in learning outside of the classroom through study abroad undergraduate research. We're taking full advantage of our location here in the city of Worcester through offering opportunities for internships for our students. They're com uh, completing over 160,000 hours of, of some type of hands-on experience uh, in the community through service learning, internships, clinical practicums uh, down in the hospitals and in various organizations. Uh, so we feel our students are getting a great experience here on campus by taking full advantage of what the city of Worcester uh, has to offer them. Um, and a really unique part of Worcester is the collaboration amongst all the other colleges and universities and the fact that you as a student here at Worcester State have our campus of around 5,500 undergraduate students but really have the opportunity to meet over 38,000 college students from all over the world. Um, so I think being relatively local, uh, sometimes you can think, well, they're right down the road, you know, maybe we won't visit or we'll, you know, sort of add them to the list later on in the process. But um, for many students, Worcester is, is the place to be for, for higher educational opportunities. So um, again, happy to have you here tonight and hopefully you get some, some good Good information. I will share with you that many of us have done panels like this in the past um, and that we have some commonalities but we also have a lot of differences and tonight is not meant to overwhelm you by our differences but really just to help kind of explain to you a little bit more about the college process. We understand that it also can be filled with lots of anxiety and stress um, but know that ultimately our goal at the end of tonight is to help you learn a little bit more about the process but more importantly make connections. Um, you know you may be actively looking at some of our schools you may be not but know that we are resources for you through this process and would certainly welcome uh, any opportunity to connect with you and help guide you through um, this process. Just by show of hands, how many of you is this the first time you're going through the college and admissions process um, with your either your son or daughter, family member? Okay. So about half. How many of you have done it before? You're an expert. Consider yourselves experts. No. Okay. <laughs> Well, fair enough. Uh, that just gives us a good baseline to kind of understand, um, you know, what we're what we're in for tonight. I think again, it's it hopefully will be informative for you. Uh, hopefully, we'll have some fun and some laughs along the way. I get the honor of being your MC for tonight uh, and kind of helping to lead the conversation. So, I think what we'll do to kind of get things kicked off, I'm going to start off with Terry at Clark. And Terry, if you wouldn't mind just uh, talking to the group a little bit more about uh, some of the uh, resource, the best resources resources to use uh, when starting out the college search process. Process, maybe talk a little bit about some common mistakes that you feel students and families may make in this process, um, and then round out with uh, the role that letters or recommendations play in the overall process. Sure. So, and start off with about resources. There are a lot of resources out there. Um, you have some available to you just from the people that you know and know you. Um, you know, there's a college counselor or school counselor at your school that could potentially be a great resource in talking to them about the things you're interested in. And and help start a list for you, uh, your teachers, people like that can be a great resources. There are tons of online resources. Um, you get Princeton Review, CapEx, College Niche, I can't even think of them. There are a lot of different search engines where you can go in and start to put some of the things that you're thinking about. Where do I want to go to school geographically? Do I want to stay in Massachusetts, New England area? Do I want to look broader than that? Do I want a small or a medium or a large school? Do I have academic interests I'm in? And you can put all of those into the various search engines and start to get a list of schools. I think a great resource that you have are the colleges. So you might know that you don't want to go to school in Worcester. You might want to go farther away. But our campuses can still be great places to start your search. You might know you want to go farther away, but you don't know what is a campus that has 1,700 students feel like compared to 5,000 compared to something higher. We have a range of sizes. You don't, you know, when we talk about a liberal arts education versus a career focused education versus a STEM education, you can go on our campuses and see what that means and how we present our campus 
services. And that can give you a sense of, okay, I know I want a larger school that has a focus on STEM, or I want a smaller liberal arts campus. And then based on that experience, to go out and visit other schools in different geographic areas. So I think that our campuses can be a great resources. We as individual people um, can be a great resources. Pick up business cards today. I know that I'm happy to answer questions uh, for students, even if they're not specifically going to be looking at Clark. I actually had a, a father call me the other day and he's like, I met you this summer at a program you were doing and I'm calling specifically because my daughter's not going to apply for Clark and I feel like that means you'll give me an honest answer. I'm like, <laughs> I'd give you an honest answer no matter what, but sure, I'm happy to help out. But, but there's a lot of online resources, uh, things like that, that you can tap into. I think one of the mistakes that people make when they're starting out this process is to think if I haven't heard about the school, it can't be good. So somebody might suggest a school to you and you might say, I've never heard of it. I'm not going to look at it. Um, there are a lot of colleges in this country, and some of them fairly local, that you might never have heard about. It doesn't mean it's not the right choice. It doesn't mean it's not the right choice for you. I do think also people start to focus a little too much on the right choice, thinking that they have to find that exact one school. There's only one school for every person. There's a lot of great schools out there, um, and a lot of them can be good fits for you. Um, so be open-minded as you go through the process. I think that's the, the biggest thing that can help um, go through. Um, advice I'll give to kind of families is also, this is an important process, but you don't want it to consume your relationship as a family. Um, you don't want it to be your junior year, senior year, and every conversation you have is about college. Nobody will like that experience. What my family did when I was going through this, and partly because I was getting tired of my parents asking me questions, is I said we'd have a conversation Sunday nights about college. College. If you had a question, wait till then. Um, and it helped my family get through the process because they could ask me about other things and I could, we could have other conversations. But it wasn't always, did you call the school to set up your interview? Did you write that essay? Did you do this? Did you do that? Um, but we knew that Sunday after evenings we were going to have that conversation so we could all stay on the same page. Uh, in terms of recommendations, um, Different schools will use them different ways. Um, a lot of our schools um, up here do what's called a holistic reading process, which means we really are trying to get to know the whole you. Uh, how you do in your classroom is important, uh, but you're going to be living on our campus and part of our community, and we want to get that broader sense. And recommendations can help us get some of that broad sense of who you are. The teachers that you ask to write your letters of recommendation know you as people. They might tell us about your great sense of humor. They might tell us that you're the first person that volunteers when any one needs some help and also give us some academic information um, but more than the student got a B plus in my class they'll tell us about how engaged you were in the classroom and and how you prepared and did you know when to ask for help and ask for help and did you participate and did you do things on time so we get a lot deeper richer information than just Student got a B plus in my class. We already know that from the transcript. But your recommend people that write you recommendations know what went into that B plus, and we can learn a lot from from that. But they know you as people, and that is definitely something that that we want to know about. You're going to become community members, not just people sitting in our classes. So we want to get that whole picture, and people that already know you well can help shape that picture for us. Thank you, Terry. Uh, next up, I'm going to throw it to Diane to talk a little bit about um, sort of the trends that we're seeing in college admissions as it relates to growing numbers of uh, applications and how you as a student can perhaps make your application stand out in the admissions process, uh, and then also the role that the GPA plays in the overall admissions decision. Great. Um, well, I think, you know, one of the the perva uh, pervasive to topics of discussion in admissions right now is the volume and the number of applications colleges are receiving and how are colleges possibly evaluating all those and how are you making your choices, right? All of us up here who work in, in college admissions have been asked this at 4th of July barbecues, <laughs> wherever we go, right? If you work in admissions, it's like, oh great, can I have a question? How do you, how do you go through all of this? Um, what I can say is that 
There are a lot of students applying to colleges. Students are applying to higher numbers of colleges than they did likely when their parents were applying. So parents, you think about how many colleges you applied to, and now your son or daughter is coming home and saying, I'm going to apply to 15, and you're saying, what? You know, so I mean, th there are students applying to a lot of colleges. Not all students are doing that. You do not need to do that. Um, the more prep work that you can do ahead of time, as Terry was suggesting, with figuring out what's a really great fit for you and narrowing down your choice choices that are good choices for you academically, that are good choices for you financially, the less you'll have to kind of panic and toss out a bunch of applications. And what you really want to focus on is if this school is the right fit for you, showing that school why and showing that school why you would be a great community member for them. So in terms of how an applicant can stand out, there's two ways you can stand out in life, right? For good reasons or for bad reasons. Um, and you want to do the good reasons. You want to do the former, not the latter. Um, we all can think of ways that you can stand out for good or bad reasons in life, and so can college admissions officers. Um, so when I say that, you know, your essay, take your essay for example. You can stand out for good reasons if you've taken the time to write a thoughtful essay, if the school requires it, where you're talking about your interests, you're telling the admissions counselor something else about yourself, it's well written, it's been proofread. You can also stand out for bad reasons if it's very sloppy, you have sentences in there that aren't sentences, and you mention the name of another college, right? There are things that you can do to stand, people will remember you, right? Um, but it's whether they're remembering you for the good things that were in your application or the things that made them think, I don't know if the student is the right fit for us because they were talking all about how they really want to do this STEM program in these seven week classes and I think they just submitted WP's es WPI's essay to Holy Cross, right? And I, I, we don't have seven week you know, program rotating classes. They clearly were doing research on another institution. They're going to be a great fit there. So you do want to think about fit. You want It's your time to show admissions counselors beyond academics why what you think you've really done. Um, we don't expect your whole life story. Students get really nervous about how can I stand out? How can I tell them everything about me? We're not going to know everything about a student in an application, but we do want to get a sense of what that person is like. Um, admissions counselors, they say, how can you handle all of this volume, all of these applications? Whether a school gets 2,000 applications or 20,000 applications, they will have a process in place to make sure that every application is reviewed. Please do not think that you're sending these things out into cyberspace and no one's reviewing them and people are just looking at your SAT scores or your GPA and making a little grid and making a decision based off just that. Um, so, you know, schools are looking at what you do in terms of ex extracurriculars. They're reading those recommendation letters. Now, every school is going to do this in a slightly different way. Um, how do we handle this all? with a little bit of, of time spent <laughs> away from our family and friends and loved ones in the winter, right? I mean, that's application reading season. And anyone who's up here has spent quite a bit of time reading applications and saying, nope, sorry, I can't go out to dinner tonight, have fun, bring me something back, right? Um, but but all of us, you know, we do that. This is, this is what we love about this job. We love getting to know students. We love admitting students to our college. Not denying students. We're not denial counselors. We're admission counselors. And so we really Really do love that part of our job. In terms of GPA and the role that that will play, for almost any college, and someone can correct me if I'm wrong, I mean, GPA is going to play a role. We want to be admitting students who are successful, who are going to be able to be successful on our campuses, to thrive in our classrooms, and to graduate. Because it does no good for you or for us to bring you to our campus if we feel that academically you can't handle the classes and you're not going to be able to graduate from our school. Now, that being said, every school has different requirements. Every school is, has different things that they're looking for. Um, the GPA will play a role in admissions decisions, but it is not the be all end all. That's not the system we have here in the United States where you're just looking at one, you know, number or ranking that kind of determines what eligibility, what schools are, are open to you for options, right? Um, so we will look at GPA. A lot of schools will be looking at the school that you go to, the classes that were available to you. Did you challenge yourself and take interesting classes and in areas that you were interested in? If you want to be an English major, did you take some of those, you know, um, English classes that 
really we're gonna enhance your skills and be good for you, but we're looking at this as a composite, right? GPA, for those of you panicking that maybe your GPA was a little lower and now it's getting better, that's a good trend. For those of you that did the reverse and had really high grades freshman year and are starting to go down, think about that because we want students who are on the upswing, right? When you're taking students into a college, you want students who are, are hitting their stride and really showing their academic potential. So you wanna make sure your academic potential is a higher number, not a lower number. Um, but it is, we're not gonna see you as just that number. It's going to be one piece of that holistic puzzle that we're looking at. Thank you, Diane. Uh, next up, we'll head over to WPI and Andy, if you wouldn't mind talking a little bit more about, uh, so you might have heard there's some lingo out there around early action, early action restrictive, early decision, the different ways that you can go about applying. Um, so if you wouldn't mind talking a little bit more about the early plans, uh, does every college have them? And then sort of shifting gears and talking about the role of technology in the admissions process. Um, and what I think is on a lot of families' minds is the roles that perhaps social media plays uh, in um, making admission decisions. Thanks, Joe. Um, so uh, first of all, um, I'm going to start out just talking about what are the, the five specific types of recognized admission um, uh, application choices that you have at your disposal, depending on the schools you're considering. So uh, the first is regular decision. Uh, once upon a time, this was college admissions. You know, you <laughs> filled out an application in September, October, November, you sent it in, and then you waited six months uh, agonizing over what was gonna happen and you got a bunch of decisions within the span of three days and then you had a few weeks to make up your mind. Um, so regular decision now, um, typically uh, schools are giving you at least a month uh, before the May 1st deadline, which is a deadline that all schools up here um, uh, basically agree to give you that time to consider your uh, admissions options as well as your uh, financial aid. Uh, packages uh, if you are eligible for aid. Uh, and so that's meant to give you at, at least that month buffer uh, with regular decision. Now there, there are some exceptions and some differences and so um, I'll talk about those. The, the second uh, type of admission which is, uh, has been, become increasingly popular over the years is rolling admission. Uh, and that simply says that uh, applications are reviewed by the school as they're received. Uh, and so different schools will have different uh, guidelines typically about what your expectation can be. Usually we try to manage your expectations. Otherwise we know you're gonna be calling our offices and saying, hey, just get my application. Um, so, you know, you might hear a school say, uh, you know, we aim for a two week turnaround, uh, two to four weeks. You might hear an eager school say, well, we'll get you a decision in a week. Um, you know, some of the, the technological improvements uh, that have occurred over the years have allowed us to cut down some of the manual processing uh, of applications that took a lot of time. Uh, so rolling decision, um, basically it's very similar to regular decision. The only distinction is that uh, if you apply uh, earlier in the cycle, uh, you will likely hear back earlier than if you applied at that same time to a rolling decision school or regular decision school, excuse me. Uh, rolling decision also uh, at many schools can often go throughout a part of the summer or up until classes start. Um, there's also early action, um, and early action uh, is a non-binding uh, process where schools will each have their own set of uh, dates or deadlines for you to submit your materials, and then they'll have a decision notification deadline. It's basically an agreement by the school to say that if, if you help us manage the reviewing of this process uh, and submit your mater materials by our early action deadline, let's say November 15th, we promise that in five weeks, you'll receive a decision from us. And so that lets students know that, you know, if you're ready, you know, that's a great opportunity to find out the decision earlier, but because it's not binding, you don't owe that school anything. You haven't given up any control over your process. It's just the school is notifying you of that admissions decision sooner in the process uh, so that you can then have that time uh, to consider your options, to go over the financial aid process if applicable. Then we get to early decision, which is very similar. There's a specified deadline date, uh, and a specified uh, notification uh, date that the school will notify you. Uh, early decision is binding. And so uh, if you apply to a school that's early decision, you can only apply to one school that's early decision. Uh, and if they accept you, 
that's where you are going. Uh, regardless of how many other schools you had applied to, uh, you're actually expected to pull those back. Uh, you also have to work with your school counselor, uh, where you sign a contract, the school counselor signs a contract uh, to basically agree to this, uh, this principle. Um, the only caveat is if you are uh, literally unable to afford the school, um, and you can document that, um, that that's a consideration schools will make, um, but that doesn't mean whether you feel like you can afford it uh, or if the school feels like you can afford it. So you really want to be certain if you're considering uh, an, an early decision option. I'll, I'll get back to that uh, in a moment, but I want to mention uh, the final one, which uh, has popped up, I don't know how many years ago, um, but it even confuses uh, some of us in admission sometimes. <clears throat> There's something called restrictive single choice early action. Um, <laughs> I know, I know. Um, we get parodied sometimes for good reasons. Um, but it's, it's different for different schools, and so it's important, again, sort of the caveat is uh, regardless of, of uh, what type of application you're, you're using in a different school, just make sure you're aware of the deadlines and the expectations for each type. And so uh, for different schools, this can mean different things, uh, but specifically you're applying to an earlier deadline like early action, early decision. Um, you are not bound to go to that school. However, there's a restriction on the other schools that you can apply to uh, early. Uh, so the, a school may only want you to apply early action to them, um, and other schools may restrict uh, certain types of uh, early ap application plans, I guess another uh, restrictive single choice early action. Um, I'm seeing some quizzical glances there. Um, I may, have, I may have described it incorrectly, but I think I described it correctly. Um, so obviously the college admissions process can be confusing, right? So if that doesn't make sense to you, ask. Uh, none of us are going to judge you for any question. Some of the I literally, I wrote down the notes because I'm not familiar with that. So, I, you know, like it's important. Even those of us who are in the field, there are a lot of things that maybe we should know. And then we're like, oh, geez, I got to Google that later. Um, so don't be afraid to ask questions. That's the big piece is that we're all here to help you guys. Uh, so when is an early application appropriate? Um, if you're confident that you're ready to apply, you have your materials, you feel good about where your grades are, uh, there's nothing you feel like you're working on, polishing up, you want to get that, uh, you know, I'm going to go with math, get that math score up a little bit before you apply to a STEM school. Um, you know, if there are things you're considering there, Maybe wait until you feel like you're putting your best foot forward. Um, talk with your school counselor. Um, you know, talk with talk with your family members, uh, and talk with the school. Let them know, hey, I'm thinking about this, but you know, I'm really working on my math grade. I'm taking a challenging course. I really want to show you I can I can thrive. Junior, year I wasn't as pleased with. And we take that into account. That's good information for us. Um, so, but if you're if you feel like you're ready and you know the terms and conditions uh, for the early plan that you're considering, uh, by all means, um, you know, go for it. Um, so, some some caveats there. It's important to consider again if it's binding or not. So, if if you're either uh, agreeing early decision to go do that school if you're admitted. That should be your top choice. You shouldn't be waffling. Uh, if at all possible, you should have visited that school at least once. You should have talked to someone at the very least at that school. Uh, you should know why you want to go there, number one. It shouldn't be sort of a tactic to get into a school. Um, know that that's the place you want to go. It's not for everyone, but for some students who know, it's a, it's a great way to go about the process. Um, for early action, um, enrolling decision, usually it's going to get you a decision sooner and you're not going to give anything up. Uh, so usually there's not a lot of downside there. Uh, when you might want to wait, again, if you're working on a different, uh, a different credential, you want to rewrite that essay one more time, you know, don't rush it. Uh, make sure you're putting your best foot forward. Uh, let's see, what else? Uh, not every college has early admission. Um, so again, go to their websites, uh, ask the office if it's not clear uh, what their deadlines are or what options they offer, just ask. Uh, email, phone, whatever you're comfortable with. Uh, and then the final part of my question, uh, what's the role of technology in admissions? Um, anybody start getting a lot of mail in the past year? <laughs> no, that's weird, right? Totally weird. Um, we bought your name. Um, <laughs> 
I'm going to be honest. I don't know about these other characters. No, I'm kidding. Um, so uh, technology is a huge driver in the process. It's how we find out about you all early in the process. It's how you find out about us, um, as we mentioned earlier. Um, technology is a great facilitator in this process. Um, so uh, primarily, one of the, the biggest uh, changes over the past decade or two, uh, most of our applications are online, whether it's an institutional uh, application, uh, whether it's a, a state application, whether it's um, a common application, the coalition application, you'll get to know these things if, if they don't make sense, but um, typically a lot of the transactions you're having online, we may communicate with you online, email, text, chat. Um, we might come through your Alexa and just start talking to you at night. <laughs> WBI. Uh, sorry. <laughs> we won't do that. That's really creepy. Uh, <laughs> it's proprietary. <laughs> it was an MQP project. <laughs> so anyway. Um, and then the final piece, social media, right? Who here is concerned that we might see your social media? All right, no one's going to raise their hand with mom and dad here. Um, make your accounts private right now. Um, Joking. Uh, we go through, you know, 10,000 applications at WPI with about 15 committee members. Similar ratios at other schools. We read a lot of applications. We're not instantly going to some secret back end to Facebook through Cambridge Analytica to, to find out all your, your details. Um, however, if you've upset someone or there may have been a, a rough breakup, uh, sometimes someone may send information to an admissions office. Sometimes something may happen where your school picks up on something. Uh, information does come to us, and so that can be taken into uh, account depending on the institution, depending on the type of incident. Again, uh, you know, we are uh, not denial officers, we're admissions officers, we're not trying to, to peg anyone, but um, if you have to think before you post it, don't post it. Uh, it's just a good rule, especially over the next 12 months. Um, and uh, social media situations can have negative implications, not just for applicants, but for students who've already been admitted, and even, in some rare cases, students who have already confirmed their attendance at a school and may be planning on going there in a week or two. So I'll stop there. Thank you. All right, next up, we'll go to jump to Kevin from Becker to talk about uh, making a list of colleges and how to, how to make a list of colleges and, and universities to apply to, uh, talking a little bit about um, perhaps how you as the student um, can let a university or college know uh, that you're interested in them. Um, and then what are the advantages of looking at um, colleges and universities that offer co-op or internship opportunities? Thanks. Um, we asked earlier, is this on? Is it, you, you, can you hear through them? Okay, sorry. Um, we asked earlier for parents, how many of you, for how many of you is this the first child going through? For, for the students in the audience, how many of you are absolutely certain of what it is you're gonna major in when you go to college? By show of hands. <laughs> You're all gonna change your mind. <laughs> <laughs> a few nights, <laughs> Denny. How many of you are undecided? Just again, by show of hands. <laughs> a little even trembling, uh, trembling about being undecided. I, I just want to begin this by, especially if this is your first child going through, this is the first time a student's going through this. You're all gonna find a place to go. Uh, just be reassured. Uh, that there's lots of information, there are lots of steps in the process, but you can master this, uh, you will learn this. Uh, by, the, by this time next year, you'll be packing uh, to go away to college and, and your parents won't, uh, um, won't miss you a bit, no. Uh, <laughs> they'll redecorate your room in a heartbeat. Um, so uh, please be reassured that, that despite what can seem like overwhelming information, you'll all find a place to go. Um, how to make a list for uh, colleges and universities to apply to is my first chart. Uh, it, I feel like I'm gonna repeat much of what Terry from Clark said, that there's a wealth of information available to you. And then picking off of what Andy said about technology changing things, um, and not so long ago, you had to go by guidebooks that were bigger than the Bronx phone book. It just uh, huge uh, pages, listing after listing after listing of school and page through them. And they were useless within three months. And the, you know, the, the next crop, uh, um, you had to go out and buy a new one for the, for the next student. So um, technology has changed this for you. The internet uh, has changed everything for us. Um, 
Uh, it, over the last decade, it's changed everything. There are lots of ways to learn. Again, someone's mentioned some of the search engines like CapEx uh, that, that are available. Um, my personal favorite is the College Board, um, and there's a way to go into the College Board and search for schools and search very specifically for what you're uh, interested in. And just by way of example, I'm fond of some audiovisuals, but this is the page that I printed off, and it reads, um, you have 3,788 college options. Choose a category on the left to find the right ones for you. We'll help you along the way. The categories listed on the left-hand side include test scores and selectivity, type of school, location, campus and housing, majors and learning environments, sports and activities, <laughs> academic credit, paying additional uh, support services. So you can drill down on each of those topics. I only touched on one, campus and housing. So it's campus and housing comes up and there are more th choices for you to learn a little bit more about. The setting, residential or commuter campus, housing availability, special housing options, cars for freshmen, always an important uh, topic. Uh, so there are seven or eight uh, uh, additional options for you to drill down and learn about what kinds of colleges might actually um, offer those kinds of programs or give you information about selectivity, about housing, uh, about paying for college. You'll need to drill down once you've discovered what colleges fit all of your criteria. Again, our websites are designed to provide students with the information we think is most important to you. So I take advantage of what we uh, have uh, up and available for you. I don't think there's any substitute for human interaction. So if you're going to be visiting some schools, go through the website, uh, look for questions or things you're not certain about. And uh, maybe during a group session or an interview, you can ask your questions and uh, God willing, get the right answers from the person you're talking to on campus. So uh, there, there's the, the depth and quality of your preparation um, for this process is probably gonna be reflected in the ease of this process. Um, I'm gonna go pretty quickly because I, I hope we can get to your questions and, and our answers, which I think is probably everyone's favorite part. How can I let a university know that I'm interested in? Uh, so the term of art in admissions is demonstrated interest. Um, and that would be an interesting question to ask individuals uh, when you visit the campus if demonstrated interest is part of the, the selection process. Uh, some uh, colleges and universities are acutely aware of who's contacted them, who's visited, who showed up at a high school visit and talked to a, a rep who's visited the campus, who attended an open house on campus, who might have interviewed, who might have interviewed with an alumni uh, if they're not able to get to campus. So there's, there are many uh, uh, bits of data that we uh, can track through our CRMs, uh, Customer Relationship Management Software, that allows us to uh, um, be in contact with you. We buy names. Uh, we track our, our activity, we track your responses to, to, our, to our activity. Um, and and it's, uh, make no mistake, this is a very competitive business that we're all in. We're all collegial uh, and we're not running each other down, but we're fighting very hard to get the right number and right kinds of students uh, on our campus. And this, the more data we can accumulate uh, to use to sharpen our messages and our financial aid packages, uh, uh, for prospective students, the better off uh, we're all going to be. Um, I think letting, I think students, once they've selected the schools they're going to apply to, uh, I think you need to manage this contact back and forth with uh, schools. Uh, it doesn't do any harm to send a thank you note if you've been on campus for an interview. Uh, if you've met with an alumni, uh, uh, let them know you appreciate their time, their volunteers. Uh, if you're uh, coming to uh, visit a campus and you meet a tour guide, sometimes it's a, uh, um, uh, you'll get a thank you note from a tour guide. You may be able to respond to that tour guide. So it's all about uh, communications back and forth to let um, um, colleges know that you're interested in them. I'd encourage you not to carpet bomb colleges um, trying to demonstrate your interest. In, uh, you know, don't don't overdo it. Be selective about the schools you're most interested in. Um, don't 
don't send us cupcakes, uh, don't send us <laughs> t-shirts, don't send us gift cards. Um, I personally prefer cash. Uh, <laughs> just write your name on a $20 bill, that'll work. But, um, and, and I wish I were kidding about the cupcakes, t-shirts, and gift cards, but in, uh, over the course of my career, all those things have come into offices that I've worked at uh, and other stranger things uh, is probably the best way to put it. Go on. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I know this is shocking. Um, so it, it, it's a process you can manage, um, and, and we're interested in hearing from you. Um, and I, I'd encourage you to take advantage of that. The third one uh, topic is what advantages um, of co-op and internships? Uh, um, what are the advantages of co-ops and internships while I'm in college? Uh, I, I think it's just manifest to those of us on this side of the table that these are terrific opportunities for young people to uh, get outside of the classroom, whether it's a, a research opportunity, so I'm gonna expand this, a research opportunity, an internship, whether it's paid or unpaid, a co-op, typically those are, are paid and semester long, uh, study abroad, um, and maybe an internship abroad. So something that removes you from the classroom uh, to do something outside uh, of the safe confines of, of that classroom. Uh, it's a chance for students to test out careers. Uh, it's a, a, it's a, a chance for prospective employers uh, for, you to, for you to demonstrate what you know and what you can do. Um, it's a chance for, for you to make some contacts, uh, to introduce yourself to the, the web of contacts that might support you throughout your career. Uh, it's a, a terrific way for, for you to demonstrate who you are, what you know, what you can do. And I, again, uh, um, I think that when we see students coming back from internships or from these research experiments, experiences from these study abroad experiences, I think those of us who are on a campus recognize how transformative, and that's a word that I, I don't use lightly, how transformative these experiences can be for young people. And I'll, I'll, one anecdote, I worked at Boston, sorry, uh, uh, I did work at Boston University. I worked at UMass for 10 years, and one of my favorite tour guides uh, was uh, so focused in uh, sport management, he wanted to work with Major League Soccer. He got his dream internship in New York City working for the home office of, of MLS. Uh, this is a bright guy, a uh, funny kid, and within three weeks, he was miserable. He worked for this for <laughs> three and a half years. Uh, in three weeks, he was on the phone to his academic advisor saying, I, I, I don't think I can do this. I don't want to do this. Uh, sorry, his second semester of his junior year. Uh, I don't want to do this anymore. I can't believe uh, I've invested so much time. Um, and he came back to campus, talked to his advisor, made some adjustments in his curriculum, uh, wound up doing something still in sport management. Uh, he uh, realized an entrepreneurial bent, still looking at sport management related to soccer and promotion, and was able to adjust his curriculum and his plans before he graduated. Uh, walked out, walked into a terrific job, uh, not with MLS, and there was nothing wrong with them, with them, it was just him changing his mind. So these experiential learning uh, um, programs allow students to test out is it what you're really interested in and you still have time to change? And I'll stop there. All right, so we're a little bit more than halfway done. How's everyone doing so far? <laughs> Good? There is still plenty of refreshments. Please, by all means, it's, it's, it's getting late. You've probably been working all day. Um, feel free to get up, grab something to eat, um, grab some more coffee, take a seat, and we're just gonna keep rolling on. Um, I do, am I, I'm also, as my role as MC, sort of keeping track of time. So I am for the panel. It's gonna condense the questions a little bit so that we can finish up with the last few topic areas. And really, we wanna be able to uh, allow you guys to ask any questions specifically of us that you may have. So if you do have one, know that we're going to get there feel free to write it down and we'll, we'll certainly leave plenty of time at the end for questions so mike i'm going to throw it over to you uh, to you next to talk just generally um around extracurricular activities resume activity sheet uh what students can should be doing uh in high school um to position them themselves well to be a well-rounded candidate for admission um you know a lot of times students think well i'm going to get involved as in much as possible because that's going to be that's going to come across as impressive to the admissions committee um so what would be some advice that you have around extracurricular activities and, and also how students can best display what they're doing outside of the classroom uh 
I mean, it, it comes really down to um, you know, your letters of rec, your essay, coming in for an interview, submitting a, a resume to us. All of those, all forms of, uh, all those are, way, are ways in which you can show that you know, the, the projects, um, the work that you've done throughout high school. Um, you know, we've been saying all night we're, we're admission counselors, not denial counselors. Many of us up here have reiterated that we, um, we want to find ways to get to know you. We want to look past just your test scores. We want to look past just your transcript. We want to get to know the student behind that story. Um, you know, coming in for an interview at any point, maybe halfway through your junior year, summer going into your senior year, early on in your senior year before you've submitted your application, we will, we will take notes. We might not write it down during the interview. We may be gathering all that in the back of our minds and then afterwards either filling out a form or just writing notes within an application file uh, on our database that we keep all the students so that when we go back and read your application, we're able to refer back to uh, you know, that interview form or that, that interview and say, oh yeah, I remember, I, I remember meeting Sally. She was really great. She came prepared. She, uh, you know, she had a great uh, personality. Uh, she really described things about her time in high school that really make me think she's going to be successful here at so and so college. And that's what we're looking for. We're looking for ways to predict success. Um, you know, for instance, I had a student uh, from Worcester that came to visit uh, and did an interview with me recently. And her thank you note, as somebody said, to send was a nice, really well written thank you note. But on the outside of the envelope. It was the assumption Greyhound that she drew. So it, it really attracted my attention. It was something else that I added to her file so that, again, when we go back in and read that application in a few months, I'll see that and it'll you know, tr kind of trigger that memory. Um, get involved. You know, we, we, I always tell students, uh, especially at a place like Assumption, we want to bring in strong, gifted academic students but we're a real community-minded um, institution. I think many of the schools here would be able to say that. We don't want students that are just gonna sit in their residence hall and study. We want students that are gonna be part of the community that are essentially going to quote unquote um, give back. And the only way we're really able to see that is through the work that you're doing um, in high school. So you know, pull out that resume, build that up, you know, don't do things just for the sake of doing it, because to some extent, we'll see through that. But show that you've made a commitment if you're doing things for three, four years, whether it's a sport, a job, a club, or organization on campus. Those things really do stick out to us um, and will help build uh, a real strong profile for you, uh, you know, during the application or during the decision process. Thank you. Uh, John, was there any, I know you sort of talked a little bit earlier about the role of test scores in the admissions process. Anything else that you wanted to sort of? I helped organize the program, but I obviously didn't organize myself. <laughs> so no. Okay. We'll keep this going and go to the next topic so that we Perfect. can ask questions at the end. Very good. Uh, Allison, we'll throw the mic to you next. Um, if you wouldn't mind just talking a little bit about the role of the college essay. So maybe you might okay. want to share some tips, uh, best practices around how students can go about approaching the college essay. Many of the students maybe in the room have begun to think about their essay topics or even started writing it. Um, and then maybe you might want to talk a little bit about the role that the essay may play in the admissions review process. Absolutely. So how many of you have started your college essay? Wow. Great, awesome. Um, that's generally how I start my info sessions in August, because some of us are Common App schools. Um, and if you're not familiar with the Common Application, I'm sure we'll touch on that later. Um, but the Common App essays are open. Um, so my first step would be to create an account um, and start looking at the college um, Common App essays of some of your schools are Common App schools. Not, not all of us are Common App schools, um, but that's definitely something to look for, especially if you have a couple weeks before you go back to high school, maybe have a draft ready to go. Um, my mom was a high school guidance counselor for 35 years. She just retired. Um, and I feel like my college essay was edited over my kitchen table every Sunday night, kind of like we joke about Sunday nights. Um, so definitely have someone look at your college essay. Um, I know that a lot of you want to be independent. You just want to submit it. You don't want mom to look at it. If you don't want mom and dad to look at it, that's totally fine. Um, but have your English teacher look at it. Have someone you 
trust, look at it. Um, my biggest piece of advice is you might think you're the expert, but I hate to tell you, I'm not the expert and you're not the expert. Maybe mom, your guidance counselor, your teacher could be the trusted expert that you're thinking about. I think that's really important. Um, the strongest essays are the earliest essays that I receive. I know that's an opinion for sure, but I believe that my early action essays are definitely stronger because those are the students that put the effort in generally over the summer or the month of September. Um, I definitely encourage that as well. Um, coming from a STEM school, I really love the essay. Um, why? Because it's better than your average GPA, your average test score, what makes you different. We do a holistic review at our university and it makes you stand out. Um, some of the best essays I've read, um, one last year actually was Fruit Loops and how cells are divided and he was a medical and molecular biology major, shocking. Um, but he really talked about how everybody is built different and so is a box of cereal kind of unique. Um, but that was a really cool essay. We always use that in our essay writing workshop. Um, that's another thing to definitely think about. Some colleges will put on workshops, definitely attend those. Some uh, high schools will put on workshops, definitely attend those as well. Keep your eyes open. There's even some in the area um, to, for you to definitely attend if you have questions too. I love the college essay because it explains you. Um, a lot of the students, um, especially in the science field, have been interns or they've volunteered. Um, they sat with grandma at a nursing home and that's why they want to be a nurse. Um, that's great. Everybody wants to save lives on the essays that I read. I'm just going to be honest with you. Um, and that's the jokes I get at the 4th of July parties too. Hey Al, like, what'd you read about this year? Another person die? It's horrible to say that. Um, but I really want to learn why you want to go into healthcare. It's great that you wanted to save lives, but what else? Was it your AP bio teacher that really inspired you? Um, was it a job shadow experience? Was your aunt in the ER and you learned something there? Um, definitely explain that. Um, but we also don't see the outside things. Um, so if you're an Eagle Scout, that's a big thing to talk about. I really love those. That shows in, um, a, definitely a leadership quality for our students. Um, so definitely the college essay makes you shine. We do read them. They may be our Thanksgiving night post football reading session, um, but definitely explain who you are, why you want to go to the university. Um, another phone call I get about college essays too is they think there's just one essay. Um, some universities require two essays. Um, so definitely look on the common application or their specific university application because you might get an email saying your application is incomplete and you may call me in anger and be like, hey, uh, we definitely did everything. You didn't. Um, make sure that you read all the thin print or the fine guidelines because um, some of the times there's university specific essays. For example, ours this year is why you want to study healthcare in Boston, and we make it Boston specific. Um, our Worcester campus does a Worcester one, shocking. Um, so make sure you know the area that you're studying, do research, go on tour, learn from your tour guide. This is where you name drop. This is a big part of your application, especially for students that are looking at holistic universities because it just makes you shine a little bit more. Um, and we actually grade our essays um, on a scale of one through five. Um, a big thing that's already been touched is grammar. Um, some readers are different on grammar. I'm a big grammar person. Um, so definitely look through that. There's a difference between there, there, and there. Um, so keep that in mind as well. Uh, just a, so STEM, GPA, we've been throwing a lot of, around a lot of acronyms tonight. Hopefully, uh, for those of you that might not know, STEM, science, technology, engineering, math, GPA, grade point average, ED, early decision, early action. We, we kind of have developed our own language. So if you none of that is clear, certainly feel free to, uh, feel free to ask. Um, I get to uh, sort of co-present the next topic. It's going to very quickly talk a little bit about the state university uh, admissions process. And I'm going to co-present with my colleague from Quinn Sig, uh, Buffy. And what we wanted to do, we all are, as a public university, a little bit different than my private school uh, colleagues. Um, in our admissions process, we actually have admission guidelines that are provided to us by the Massachusetts Department of Higher Education. And there's a whole system of public universities across uh, Massachusetts. You've got the five UMass campuses. Uh, you've got the nine state universities, Worcester State being in that, in that group, along with Bridgewater, Salem, Fitchburg, Framingham, Westfield, uh, Mass College of Liberal Arts, Mass College of Art, Mass Maritime. Um, and then you've got 15 uh, 
community colleges. I'm a little partial thinking that you've got two of the best four year public in, in, in two year community colleges right here in, in Worcester and in, in both Worcester State and Quinsig. Um, but they really are great options. Um, I spent about 10 years in private education before coming to Worcester State six years ago. And what I really value about the admissions process here uh, as a public university is it's a pretty good amount of transparency in our process. We have guidelines provided to us by the Mass Department of Higher Education, minimum admission standards that we have to consider for students when applying for, for admission. And basically, the standards are focused around your academic performance. Um, so where my colleagues might do focus a little bit, they do a, more of a holistic review, where letters of recommendation, the essay may play a role. Uh, at public universities, and it's gonna vary a little bit, UMass, the UMass system tends to be different uh, than the nine state universities, but for us, your academic transcript is really the most important piece. And our guidelines uh, uh, guide us by saying, um, basically any student with a 3.0 high school GPA is eligible for admission to any of the nine state universities. Um, we have minimum admission standards, meaning that we have to hold minimums, but the nine state universities have the autonomy to be able to raise their minimum standards for certain programs. Um, so generally speaking, any student uh, below a 2.0 would not be admissible to any of the, in any of the nine state universities. A 3.0 means you're eligible, but at some campuses you might need a 3.2. Um, there may be some very variety in terms of the minimum GPA needed for specific majors. Um, for us at, at Worcester State, nursing is one of our most competitive programs that's gonna need a higher, a higher GPA. We recalculate the GPA, the grade point average for every student that applies. That's common amongst the nine state universities. So the GPA is important, but also the curriculum, uh, what you're taking in high school is important as well. And there's a minimum of 17 units that you have to complete in high school in order to be eligible for admission. Most of those requirements are gonna mirror what you need for your high school graduation requirement. Four years of English, four years of math, three years of a lab science, two years of a social science and humanities, two years of a foreign language, and then two um, standard or college prep um, academic electives. That really is at the core of our review process. And what those minimum standards are, are, are guiding us in, in when we're evaluating you is, is saying that if a student meets these minimum requirements or the minimum requirements set by our admissions committee focused around grades and unit uh, completion, of says that we feel confident uh, that you have an appropriate academic foundation in high school to make a successful transition to our four-year uh, bachelor's degree program um, and then for some students that are on the border um, you know that might be where letters of recommendation essays some of the other components of the application would be would be helpful in our process but for us based upon your GPA and then SAT scores if needed um, not some of the nine state universities are test optional Worcester State being one of those but not all nine of us have, have gone test optional yet Pretty much your transcript and your test scores are gonna dictate um, the review and ultimately the admissions decision um, to our universities. Um, I do wanna also let you know, you know, a good portion of our students uh, the, are coming in directly out of high school, but we also see a significant number of students that transfer to our universities. Um, each year, Worcester State specifically, we enroll about 500 new transfer students every fall, and then another 250 or so in the spring. And almost 50% of the, of the transfer students that come to us in the fall are coming from Quinsig uh, in our system or community colleges. Um, and you may be, as a transfer student, you know, maybe you moved a little far away from home thinking that you wanted to go away uh, and then you got homesick and you wanted to come a little bit closer to home. Or maybe you just started your, your educational journey at the community college level for, for whatever uh, reason that might be. Um, we do work very closely with, with the community college, specifically with Quinsig, to help students through that process so that they can get the most out of their time um, that they're spending both, both at the two-year school and then ultimately if their goal is to achieve that four-year bachelor's degree, how Worcester State can support them um, through that plan. We partner with the state through a variety of initiatives um, that Buffy will talk about, um, mass transfer, the Commonwealth commitment, um, but it is a really great option. Everyone should have a public university on their on their list of colleges, and you've got some great options right here in the, in the state. Uh, so I'll turn it over to Buffy to talk a little bit more specifically um, about um, the community college system um, and maybe some of the benefits of students starting out at the community colleges and eventually, if, if, that, if their educational journey is for the four-year degree, how they can take advantage of some of the agreements that are established between the two years and the four years. Sure, absolutely. So our, um, just to touch on, on what Joseph had said, uh, our enrollment enrollment process is a little bit different at a community college. We require a high school diploma, your transcript, or a high set uh, degree, your high set uh, certification. Um, we are rolling basis um, college. Sorry, this thing is very uncomfortable to talk into. Um, so again, we're a rolling basis college, and um, we don't, we're not on the Common App. 
We have an online application process that takes about 10 minutes. Um, I'm trying to think what else. Oh, oh uh, so 95% of our, our uh, programs require you to take the AccuPlacer exam. You'll be placed into a math and English class, and um, there's about 5% of our um, programs that don't require the AccuPlacer test. But for our programs and for our campus, our enrollment step process is a pretty st pretty simple and straightforward process. Um, you, If you want your in-state uh, in uh, tuition, make sure that you are a uh, Massachusetts resident six months prior to applying to the college. Um, again, we're, we don't have um, any type of SATs or ACT, no testing required to apply to our college. Um, in terms of uh, the role that admissions take, plays, um, submitting your transcript and following the enrollment steps is pretty much, um, and, fi and filling out the application process is what's required for our college, for our community college. Um, one of the things I would like to enhance is that if you are interested in attending a community college, definitely take a look at the campus. Come and visit the campus. Come and take a look at what we offer. Um, is it a right fit for you? Do you get a sense of that you belong there on that campus? Um, what are the benefits of attending community college? Well, I, for one, am a community college graduate. The benefit that I received from attending a community college was it was very cost effective. It was very affordable. And the articulation programs that we have with all the other colleges, all the area colleges here in Worcester and outside of Worcester, uh, really provide an excellent avenue for students to go on to their education. Um, I myself am a graduate of Quinn Sigmund Community College. After I finished community college, I went on to Northeastern. I got my bachelor's degree. I went on to Boston University, got my master's, and then I went on to law school. Where did I start? At the community college. Why did I start there? It was cost effective. It was very affordable. Um, it's definitely a viable option, and we do have so many other avenues and articulation agreements with so many different programs. Um, uh, uh, what Joseph had said earlier, we have a a lot of students that leave our healthcare programs and move on to uh, Worcester State in the health programs and the nursing program. Um, uh, WPI, we have an articulation agreement with WPI. A lot of our engineering students go for two years um, and it's very cost effective to them to go for two years and then go on to WPI and they do unbelievably great with all the different programs. We have a um, pre-pharmacy program, MCPHS. You leave uh, our school within two years. After you leave in your pre-pharm program, you go straight to the doctoral program and the pre-pharmacy program. You bypass two and a half years. Um, I'm trying to think of any of the other colleges here on, cam on, uh, on the panel. Clark, yes, oh, we have a lot of agreements with Clark. Um, so I'll, I'll move on, move on, so we can uh, move on here. Can you discuss the mass transfer? So the transfer program that we have is that students will leave our college, will leave the community college with at least a B average. You have to have a B average to um, transfer to another school. So with any, any of these colleges that we're sitting here with the panel and a lot of the other agreements that we have. Again, I mentioned a couple. I went to Northeastern. Um, that's just, a, just one. There are s any college that you can think of that you can um, you would like to transfer to. Um, you are more than welcome to take your credits and go to that class, that uh, college, and have them perform an unofficial transcript of your um, your classes and see what is transferable. But with the mass transfer, what happens with that is that the student the students that um, start with this mass transfer program uh, maintain a, um, a B average. Their classes that they take within that program for the two years all are guaranteed to transfer over. So when you're transferring over to um, Assumption or Clark or WPI or Worcester State, they will take all those classes through that mass transfer program. It guarantees to take them all. If you are applying to maybe Harvard, you're trying to get into a program, they may not take all the classes that you have taken uh, over at Quinsig, but it's a guarantee to take all the classes that you have taken with that mass transfer program with Quinsig. Um, but you do have to maintain a B, a B average do need to graduate from Quinsig with a um, QCC with a B average. Um, did you want me to touch upon the campus safety or any of that? Or no? Okay. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free. Um, again, the application process is very straightforward with ours, and um, welcome all of you on campus.
All right, great. How many of you are interested in the financial aid process? Ooh, yeah. We saved the best for last, in my opinion. So what I'd like to do now is turn it over to my colleague, Jen English, uh, from the financial aid office here at Worcester State. She's going to spend about five minutes just doing a very high-level overview of uh, the financial aid process, um, and then I will take the mic back and we'll do the question and answer portion of the, of the program. Okay, so I seem to remember that some of you are going through this process for a second time with a with a new student. So how many people here who have, have done a FAFSA before? Nobody? Okay, a couple of people at least. Um, just so you know, as a financial aid officer, I literally do a FAFSA every year just to make sure that I remember what it's like to kind of go through the pains that you all go through. So the FAFSA stands for Free Application for Federal Student Aid. I want to um, make sure that you all hear that free part, um, just because it's very important. When you do go to do a FAFSA, you're going on to the right site, fafsa.gov. There are a couple of mirror sites um, that are put together by some less than good people that will actually charge you money and then delay the process. So make sure when you are applying, apply on fafsa.gov, the governmental website. Uh, the FAFSA is a form that you need to do annually. Every single year that you want to receive financial aid or the student wants to receive financial aid in school. Um, you can apply for the FAFSA as early as October 1st. So for the uh, for the 1920 academic year, um, you can do it as early as October 1st. Um, my little catchphrase is, um, the FAFSA is scary, do it on Halloween. Um, so that's one option. Um, but just know that there are resources throughout the state to actually help you out. Um, the state of Massachusetts does a FAFSA day um, at multiple different institutions, at multiple different times as well. Worcester State, um, here in the city of Worcester, we actually have two of them. One here at Worcester State, we're planning ours for November 17th, so if you've never done the FAFSA before, please come and join us. Um, there's also one at Quinsig that's usually in like January or February. Not all the dates have been released yet, but check out fafsaday.org, um, and that is a site that will show you all the locations across the state of Massachusetts. It will allow you to pre-register, although pre-registration isn't necessary, um, but certainly come and join us on a FAFSA day. Um, now, the FAFSA is, is required for I think virtually every school. Um, so you do want to make sure to do your FAFSA, do it early. You can list multiple colleges on the FAFSA. So even if you don't know where you want to go yet, make sure to do that FAFSA as early as possible. You can list all the, all the colleges that you're interested in. You can also go back in later and add colleges as well. Um, now, the FAFSA I mentioned can be done as early as October 1st, um, but typically has to be done fairly early in the process. All of us probably have slightly different due dates. Um, for some colleges, it's February 1st. For other colleges, it's March 1st. For state aid, it's May 1st. So definitely check with your college or university to find out whether they have an early deadline for the FAFSA and definitely meet that earliest uh, earliest deadline that you can. Now some colleges also have a secondary application called the CSS profile. Um, you'll usually find that information on the financial aid page of the um, of the college or university's website. So go on and find out if re they require a CSS profile. Second way that you can do that is actually to go to the CSS profile site um, and they actually have a list of all of the colleges that require that CSS profile. Now the CSS profile, if I remember correctly, actually does cost something to do, uh, to apply for. So make sure that you're only doing a CSS profile for the schools that you actually, that actually need it. Um, I just want to give you one other option or one other kind of resource. Now the state of Massachusetts has the Massachusetts Education Financing Authority, otherwise known as MIFA. They run events. I love their events. Um, they don't have a whole lot of financing events listed up there right now, but they do admissions um, admissions programs, they do financial aid programs, they do after the acceptance programs, they do comparison programs. Um, check out their, check out mifa.org, 
um, their events page. Um, and a lot of times, I know that they, I believe, host multiple programs here in Worcester. Um, but see which one that you want to go to. You can attend multiple ones. You can attend in different cities as well. Um, so that's kind of a general overview of financial aid. Make sure to get that application, that FAFSA done, and make sure to get it done early and meet those deadlines at the colleges. Thanks, Jim. Mm -hmm. All right, so now we are available to answer any questions that you might have in the audience. Um, you can raise your hand, I'll call on you. I will repeat your question just to make sure everyone hand, uh, hears it and then throw it out to our panelists to, um, to provide their insight. So, yes, sir. So the question was uh, around transfer credit. So how might a student know whether or not a particular college is going to accept uh, transfer credit? Any volunteers? I know. Also, I think many schools, sorry. Yep. Uh, many schools have transfer calculators on their website. So um, Northeastern, I think, is one. I, I think it's some of the bigger schools in Boston. Um, we have one in Anna Maria that if a student has transferred into our college from another school, we keep track of that information and the student can go in and query to see what credit will come in. Um, that database for us is only as good as the number of transfers and the courses that have transferred in previously. So you can look online to look at um, and look up transfer credit that will come in. The other thing I think you'll find is many schools will do transfer decision days where you can commit to the office with a transcript. A transfer counselor <laughs> will sit down with you and will go through your transcript, do the evaluation so that you know what you're getting credit for, what you're not receiving credit for, and ultimately how long it will take. They'll do an audit for you so you'll see how long it will take to complete the degree itself. So whether it's online or in person, um, in most transfer offices will sit, transfer counselors will sit with or even take a transfer application, uh, I should transfer, transfer transcript and go through it with you and, and even pencil mark in where they're certain that you're going to get academic credit. So school by school, though, I think. One thing. I just want to add uh, one thing to John um, is if you're considering as Buffy was suggesting uh, you know looking at a community college uh, to to potentially transfer into another four-year institution whether it's they have a great program uh, and that leads to through an articulation agreement or if it's for affordability reasons it's close to home whatever those reasons are if you already have a sense of what you might want to do after uh, Community colleges out at I'll to Quinn Sigshorn, they do an incredible job uh, at Quinn Sig, uh, but also at other community colleges of literally working with you, helping you set up that plan so that y you know which courses you need to take. So you're not spending two years and then turning around to the college and saying, okay, what did I get? You know, like pull the lever. Um, so they're set up to help you. Um, and granted, some of you may not know what you want to do, but you may know you probably want to go to a, a four-year program. And so there are a lot of opportunities where there, there are so many articulation agreements, you're probably not going to be able to, f to figure out if you're undecided what your options are. So engage early, um, you know, even before you attend, uh, you know, that first sem semester, make sure you're, you're sequencing your courses right, you're taking the right courses to set you up for the options that you want, um, because that's specifically uh, an excellent service that uh, Quinsig and other community colleges uh, can provide you and can save you a lot of time, money, and headaches. Just on that same note, um, many of you might be, are currently taking or might be considering taking a dual enrollment course in high school to start earning college credit in, in high school. Has anyone taking dual enrollment courses? Does, does their high school offer the option to take dual enrollment courses? Does anyone want to talk about how we in the admissions world sort of handle dual students that are taking dual enrollment courses in high school? Particularly, maybe it might be interesting for students that have the opportunity but haven't explored it yet at their high school. I'll go. 
So if you took um, dual enrollment, AP, IB courses, um, it's very different per university or per college. So first off, I would encourage you, if you're going into any of them, um, to definitely talk to the admissions office and see if they will transfer. Um, for example, um, at MCPHS, we take no science or math credit, um, which is shocking because we are a science school. So a lot of our students are taking AP Bio, AP Chem, Calc 1. Um, they may have taken it at a community college um, while they're in high school through dual enrollment. Um, I feel like I'm fighting battles right now. Um, and we tell them from open house and the get-go that we like to see it for admission, but we do not transfer it in. Um, so it is great for the admissions process to definitely take those courses. We really like to see them. Um, it will only help you in your college career, but make sure you connect with the admissions office and your specific program to make sure those will transfer in. Now, it's different if they come in as a transfer student um, because we will take some of those courses but if you are coming out of high school and dual enrollment make sure you speak to your specific university if we are going to take those credits um, that would be my biggest piece of advice yes yeah, I'd like to learn a little bit more from the financial aspect if you could maybe elaborate once you do the application what is the expectation after sure. the application I mean how quick do you hear what's the process like I mean Obviously, this is our first child we put in, so we have no idea what to expect. Yeah, so the question was around sort of how to go about financing the cost of education. And we know we all have very different tuition prices, uh, the opportunities for financial aid. So I, I, let's take this as a two-prong approach. Let's let Jen clarify a little bit more on the, on the need-based financial process, and then maybe I'll look to a panelist to talk a little bit about uh, what might opportunities be around merit-based or institutional aid that, uh, that an institution, which is, again, going to vary. But those are really the two forms of financial aid that are out there need-based financial aid through our friends in the financial aid office and then merit-based or institutional aid that is often awarded uh, as part of the admissions process Okay, so one of the things that, um, as I mentioned before, you can do a FAFSA prior to application. So definitely do that FAFSA early. But what will happen is that the financial aid colleges, uh, sorry, the financial aid offices at the colleges and universities that you included on the FAFSA will receive that information. They may not act on it immediately, but they'll receive it. Worcester State, we require you to also be admitted to the college. Just accepted, don't have to um, pay your deposit or anything like that, but you do have to be accepted before we'll put the two things together. We'll take the FAFSA information, we'll process it. Um, we, basically, that means we'll read it over, take a look, put together a financial aid package for you. It may just be an estimate initially, um, but put together a financial aid package and send that out to you. We do try to get those done fairly quickly at Worcester State. We usually turn, we usually start sending out um, financial aid award letters pretty early on. Um, we are the the earliest state university to release financial aid <laughs> awards uh, out of the nine state with the, the last three years, so kudos to Jen and her team. Uh, <laughs> It is true. We, we work hard to get those things out early, but what we do is we'll send out an offer to you. We'll send out a, hey, this is what it looks like you'll, that you'll be eligible for financial aid. If we do need any more information, we'll also send that out at the same time. Just submitting that verification information doesn't mean that you're committing to the school, so feel free to send out the verification information to all the different ones. But what you'll typically get is you'll get a bunch of different award estimates or a bunch of different award letters from colleges and universities that you can then sit down and compare. Um, so that's pretty much it in a nutshell. Sure. Um, so some of the lingo, Joe mentioned that there's a lot of lingo that goes on through the admissions world. Oh, trust me. <laughs> I don't think they have any more um, lingo than the financial aid office does. Um, I mentioned the FAFSA, Free Application for Federal Student Aid. What that does is the application is going to ask you for a lot of tax information, a lot of um, income information, asset information. It's a pretty straightforward form. Um, it gives you a lot of instructions to go down through that. But what FAFSA does is it is a federal um, a federal group that will then take all that information, they'll put it in a computer, whip it all about, and then send out a number that's called the EFC, Estimated Family Contribution. 
Um, that is going to be something that is sent to all the different colleges and universities, and that's typically what we use um, as our comparison um, to create financial aid packages for, um, for the different uh, students. Now, the EFC, it is a bit of a misnomer. It doesn't necessarily mean that that's the check that you're going to be writing to the school. It's just the way that we use to kind of compare our students, let's say. Um, you know, students who have a zero EFC, we, yes, we, uh, we uh, believe that they might not have um, anything to contribute towards the student's education, so they might get a higher financial aid package than a student that has a $100,000 EFC. So that's, that's what I mean. We kind of group those students together um, and then create financial aid packages based upon that. Um, the college will use what's called an estimated cost of attendance, or a COA. Um, we're going to determine that by figuring out um, with whether the student's going to be a full-time or part-time student and whether they're going to be living off campus or on campus. That is gonna factor into it as well. So we typically, we will take that COA, We'll subtract out the EFC, that estimated family contribution, and come up with a calculated need. And that's actually what our need-based financial aid is based upon. Need-based financial aid will include grants, um, as well as work study and federal student loan. Um, and those will come from either federal resources, state resources, or institutional resources. Now here at Worcester State, we do have some institutional money that we use. Um, but we don't have as much of it, say, as other schools. That's why we're not using the CSS profile. The profile is a lot of times used by schools to, to help to um, administer that institutional aid. Um, what else? I have a few college things. Ah, yes, thank you. Ah, yes. Um, so, uh, no, you can't, actually. Well, uh, sorry, with the FAFSA. You can't. Um, again, the CSS profile is different, um, but with the FAFSA, what you're going to need to do is um, the FAFSA will determine what's called the FAFSA parent. Um, and if you are in a divorce situation, the first question it will ask is, you know, are, are, are you divorced? Um, and two, in that divorce situation, who the student has been living with most in the previous 12 months that will be the FAFSA parent. Now, if that FAFSA mm -hmm. parent is remarried as of the day that you file the FAFSA, you will have to report the information for the FAFSA parent and their new spouse, okay? That, that always kind of messes people up, but yes. So the FAFSA parent and the FAFSA parent's spouse, if there is a new one. Um, but yeah, and then the other thing that, um, I kind of live the FAFSA day in and day out, so I sometimes forget uh, about different things, but um, when you are filing the 1920 FAFSA, when you're doing it on Halloween, um, just keep in mind, we're using what's called prior prior year data. Um, what we're asking for, uh, what the FAFSA will be asking for is your 2017 tax information. Um, FAFSA is cool, it allows you to kind of download information from the IRS um, if you pass a certain criteria tests, um, or you can plug in the information yourself. But you're going to be using 2017 parent tax, or tax information, both student and parent. Um, and then, what that does is that gets to the school, we'll base everything upon that base year. Now do keep in mind, um, that's not necessarily a set in stone sort of thing. So if anyone has had some family changes, a loss of job, a loss of, um, a loss of a parent or anything like that subsequent to completing the FAFSA, you can do what's called a parent or student special circumstances. There are ways for a school to take into account if there has been, have been changes. Um, that will be done school by school though. So if you do have a special circumstance, you wanna contact the institutions themselves and they usually do have a process for going through that. We actually, we have forms. There's always a form for that. Um, we have a form, we tell you, you know, explain what happened, document what happened, and then provide us updated tax information or updated payroll information. Um, so there are ways for us to take into account more recent, um, more recent uh, changes to the family. 
I just have one or two quick things to add from the college side too. So a couple of years ago, it was federally mandated that every college needs to have what's called a net price calculator on their website somewhere. So what that means is that every college could give you something different. You're going to come back with that EFC that's going to say your family can pay $16,000 a year. And then one school is going to give you $30,000, another is going to give you twenty one, dollars another is going to give you 10000 and you're going to say, what the heck, these are all different numbers. I put in the same amount. And that's because what each college does with that information, the cost of attendance will be different at each school, but the, their ability to give different amounts of money is also going to be different. So what the net price calculator does is build in the institution-specific logic. So that's different at Holy Cross than it is at Clark, than it is at Becker, than it is at Anna Maria or Assumption, right? Everyone has a little bit of different logic into how they hand their money out, because it's their money, to decide how they're handing out and how much they have and what they're doing. So the net price calculator, you fill out your information and you'll get an estimate for what you would qualify for at that school. Um, now that being said, if you play with the numbers, I'm currently trying to buy a house and when I play with the numbers and pretend I make 40 grand more than I do suddenly like more more mortgages are available to me don't play with the numbers right you the, the data is as good as what you put in is what you're going to get out right um, and also it's not a great predictor if you do have a special circumstance so if you are someone who owns a business your you know your income is really fluctuated you've recently gone through a divorce remarriage that price, that price calculator is going to get a little fishy because it doesn't take into account all of those specialty variables but it's a good starting place to fill that out before you call financial aid offices to ask questions, which you can do. The second thing I would quickly add is because there is variance between schools. Um, you know, I, I partially mention this because I'm at Holy Cross, right? Is that just because the sticker price is bigger at one school doesn't mean that's going to be the more expensive option. It might be. It might be the more expensive option. But for example, if you're at EFC with zero at Holy Cross, we would give you everything. So a student whose family cannot afford to pay for anything would get $60,000 from across a year, right? So there are some schools, some private schools have deep pockets, others have, you know, but everyone's going to give a different amount. I'm just saying don't necessarily balk at the sticker price, right? That's an extreme example, but you may find that a private school is going to give you enough aid to make it affor as affordable as another option. It just depends on kind of what you're qualifying for with merit as well. I have a but, yeah. Does your EFC determine whether you're going to be admitted or not? I oh. just want to re so, repeat the question on that one. Um, so the question was if the EFC uh, or a family's ability to pay would influence the, admiss the admissions decision for the student. And I will touch on that. I just do want to um, expand on the merit scholarship. So we've talked a lot about filling out forms and giving us financial information and us giving you some need-based aid. A lot of colleges also have merit-based scholarships, which are based more on the student's fit for the school. They could be academic scholarships, they could be talent-based scholarships, you know, if you're applying to a school with a music conservatory program, they might have music scholarships, it could be athletic scholarship as if, if it's a Division One or a Division Two. but something about you as a student, as an, as an athlete, as a musician, as, as something like that, a school might deem that worthy of a merit scholarship. So those are available at schools as well. Uh, the question about um, does your EFC determine your admissibility? Uh, that will vary based on schools. There are some schools that are need blind and that would never come into uh, play because the admissions officer is not going to know your financial circumstance. They're not going to know um, that you even filled out the forms often at a need blind school. It'll be, on it'll be, yes. yes. And there's also a website yeah. You can look up Need Blind, but it would be splashed all over there. Yeah. Probably financial aid page. Yep. And then there are other schools that are need aware. And at those schools, they might consider a person's ability to pay um, and their ability to fund a student uh, in their decision making process. So a school might have some protocols in place that um, you if they can't fund them in a way that makes them able to come, that they're going to choose not to admit that student. Some schools will be need aware, but if admitted, fill 100% of your need. Some schools might be need aware and still gap. So there's a lot of different variations they could have, but the schools, um, especially if they're need blind and fill 100% of their need, they're absolutely going to want you to know about that. But a lot of schools will have information on their website about their various policies. Um, and if, if you can't find them, 
ask. Um, hopefully, schools are transparent in that stuff, but I'd, I'd say the majority of them are going to give you some sense of that. Yes. So my twins are simultaneously going to a college next year. So is there any need best program or you can elaborate you know, how that will help in my situation? So the question was, you've got some students going to college. Twins. You've got twins going to college. OK. Yeah. And how that might influence the college process if you have two students applying? Right. Actually, a good idea. <laughs> yeah. It's called Good Family Plan. OK. <laughs> That's a legitimate concern, yeah. So the question is uh, how um, colleges might handle or how the FAFSA might take into account uh, when a family has twins or perhaps two children. Uh, they could be going in at the same time, or you could have multiple children in college in general at different times as well. So the FAFSA already takes that into account. Um, there are a couple of questions on the FAFSA towards the end. Um, it's going to ask how many people are in your household and then how many of those people within your household, um, excluding parents, are enrolled in a degree seeking program at least half time or more. Um, and then what they'll do is when they take, um, when for example you have two students in college, they'll take kind of the, the parent contribution and they'll say, okay, you've got two in college, so you can only put half towards one student and half towards the other. So, um, so that's the way that the, that the FAFSA kind of discounts, um, uh, discounts a parent's income based upon the number of people in college. It doesn't, it doesn't work for grad school, though. If you have an older sibling who's in grad school, that's not going to get factored in. It's typically undergrad, right, that gets mm -hmm. factored yeah. into. But yeah, the EFC should get split in two. If your family can pay $20,000 a year, 10 for you, 10 for you. Some schools will do tuition discounts as well or a reduction in tuition if both students enroll. And I, I, I would say this more as a parent, less as an admissions person, a parent that has sent two kids through school I bless myself, the last one just graduated. I can't emphasize enough the importance of having conversations now. Mm -hmm. The fact that you're here, you, you actually make our lives easier. By being here tonight, you're 90% you're ahead of most of the rest of the people that we deal with. Having conversations now as a family about what you feel you can afford. And when we sat down with both of our sons and said, look, this is what we can do. I said to both of them, I don't care where you go. You can go to Europe, you can go to Russia, wherever you want to go and you can get in, you can go, but this is what I can afford. They actually self-monitored. I would watch them look at financial aid offers that came in and they would look and say, nope, nope, oh, this one's okay. So having conversations now about what you feel you can do as a family together, I think minimizes a lot of heartache as you get further and further into the process. Knowing that now, the, the fact that your kids are here, they're bright kids, they get it. They, they know not everybody's a millionaire or they know that you are a millionaire and you can afford it. Having the conversations now I think really will help them manage the list of schools that they're looking at office from and the decisions that they're making six months from now. Can I just ask a quick question? Yep. Um, regarding the notes, how I can't afford this, I was told that, that um, as a lot of, as maybe it gets closer to some deadlines, that maybe some money is left over and then you can call back and see if there's money that is left over from maybe some of the Fed money out there. And so some of those no's could become a yes. Is that mm -hmm. So the question or comment was, uh, you know, uh, Jen and, and some of us have mentioned financial aid deadlines and how important it is to meet those deadlines. And so for a student that maybe doesn't get financial aid or maybe doesn't get a, a financial aid package that, you know, they feel is going to support them funding their education, is there the opportunity to contact the individual colleges to maybe see if there's additional funding available and have an adjustment made to that financial aid award? Would anyone like to tackle that? <laughs> It depends. <laughs> um, so, yeah, uh, there are definitely different policies by different schools. Some will be very overt and will have a specific appeals process, certainly financial aid for need-based appeals, the special circumstances. The financial aid office has uh, something called professional judgment where they can review uh, individual situations to consider. Um, but if families are appealing on the merit-based side or want to share, uh, you know, this school gave me X and you guys gave me why, 
how about a little forward progress? Um, that's one I've heard. Um, you know, I, I think just it's, you're more than welcome to ask some schools, WPI, uh, we don't save any funds, we don't have a merit appeals process because our goal is to try to distribute it all uh, at the outset. Um, but I know many institutions do have it. Some will have a specific form, a process. Others, you'll have to call and contact uh, the office. I don't know if anyone else wants to. Yeah, the that. only other thing I'd say, so federal money won't be available because there's a cap to how much each student can get, and that goes with the student. Institutional aid may be available. What I will say is a lot of us, when we offer money out from our schools, people are taking it. So there's not necessarily big reserves. And the other thing that I think I didn't understand at all until I worked um, in, the, in the system is that we're putting out more offers, way more offers than our campuses can handle, right? So every school up here is putting out way more acceptances if they all say, yes, we'd all be in trouble. If they all said yes to all of our financial aid offers, we'd all be in trouble, right? Um, it's kind of like if you were trying to hire one person, you put out five job offers and they all said yes. Um, so we do that and we budget in certain analysis. But when someone calls my office and says, my neighbor got a $30,000 scholarship, they're not taking it. Can I have his money? Nope, because that was actually double offered, really. We were counting on one of you not taking that, right? So, um, so really the reality is there's probably not a time However, that being said, it doesn't hurt to ask, and you can call, you're going to get more politely, uh, you know, if you ask politely, but it doesn't hurt to ask if, if, you know, financial aid offices are willing to talk with you about that. It just is going to vary how much they can do for you. So I want to be mindful of everyone's time. We are coming up uh, on the 8 o'clock hour. I, I'll take one more question, but also know, it's everyone always waits to the end to ask their questions, um, but know that we are going to stick around so that if yeah. you do have more individualized questions that you want to ask, um, all of us will uh, will hang around um, afterwards to answer those questions one-on-one. -on -one. But for the larger group, we'll take time for, we'll take one last question and then um, and then we'll wrap things up. Thank you. Yep. should be a quick answer. Yeah. So the question was, uh, you know, when you when we were saying, you know, who to con, who to, how do we get in touch, or who should we get in touch with on our campuses to uh, to inquire to uh, to show interest? Uh, is it the admissions office? In a three? I'll start, but yes, I think it's the admissions office that you should start with. There may be a, a point later on in the process if your son or daughter is interested in a particular major, they may want to sit in on a class, and and the admissions office can facilitate that. Uh, some program, some campuses may offer overnight programs, um, but I think uh, the intake portion of it all is going to be through the admissions office. At some point, we're going to hand it over to uh, different offices on campus, depending on the institution. But admissions is is a good place to start. And would we go into, or would the individual go into the database that you guys were talking about? Mm -hmm. so that yeah. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. You get a lot. <laughs> Just you wait. It's coming. <laughs> All right. So that uh, concludes our panel. What, what do we think? Do you guys get some good information tonight? Okay, perfect. Thank you uh, so much for, for coming down tonight. Um, please grab some refreshments on your way out. Feel free to come up and ask any of our panelists some questions. Um, and we uh, w wish you uh, good luck in this process and safe travels home tonight.